5, the first section. And we left off in chapter 4, if you remember, where the church was not yet ready for Paul, and Paul was not yet ready for the church. Remember that he needed a little more seasoning or tempering and patience and prudence in particular. And we left off with Paul's brief ministry in Jerusalem, and recall that nearly got him killed. And then the church sent him home due to all this that went on to Tarsus. So there he hung out for a good 10 years, a long period of silence from Paul because we don't really know what went on during that time. We don't hear much from him. He hung out there, we, uh, we think, at his father's home, probably working on tents or in the business there. And he got a little tempering, having time to think about all that had happened to him and his message of his ministry from the Lord. And then remember who shows up? Barnabas. Barnabas shows up one day after 10 years and brings him into the Christian community. He brings him now into a ministry of teaching and preaching, and it's a real exciting journey. And that's what we're picking up today. Chapter 5 is uh, titled, The Shepherd and the Prophet. And a little introduction here, through means of a brief autobiography, Paul substantiates the statement that he received the gospel message through a revelation from Jesus Christ and not directly from any man. The next step in defense of the gospel was for Paul to demonstrate that the gospel he preaches differs in no way whatsoever than the one that is being taught by the apostles. So this is an amazing thing because they hung out with the Lord Jesus while he was here and heard his words and spent this time with him. And here comes Paul who gets just direct revelation. And so the concern was maybe he may have a different idea than we have. He didn't spend time with Jesus while he was here. So Paul relates his second visit with Cephas in Jerusalem in chapter 2. And on this occasion, he sees James again and meets John the Evangelist. Now these men were the acknowledged leaders of the Jerusalem community. By the time of the second visit, Peter concerned himself with the general welfare of the Christian community and particularly in Judea. Now, James, and understand that James, I had a question last week, I don't remember who asked if it was Kathy, about James. He had this close relationship with Jesus, and his, he'd become the accepted leader of the Jerusalem church. This is the James that's the, the bishop of Jerusalem. He is the um, author of the first Catholic epistle, James, and he is James of Alphaeus. He is not James the Lesser, who is the son of Zebedee. Remember John and James, the sons of Ze the, the Boaz, the sons of thunder. He's not that James. Apparently he's younger. So there's two different apostles named James. This is St. James, leader of that Christian community. And he became this accepted leader Paul narrates, quote, that then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas, this time taking Titus with me. So you can read about this part of it in Galatians 2, 1. And so now it is generally believed that Paul converted to Christianity around, anyone have a, a guess? What year? Around 34 A.D., 34 AD. If this is correct then, assuming this is, because that's what they believe, then he visited Cephas first probably around 37 AD, about three years later. And the second visit would have occurred probably around 50 AD. So you get a little idea of a timeline here. There's a long break in between there. So we know from Acts that Paul assisted Barnabas in Antioch, and it says in Acts 11:12 that for a whole year they met with the church and instructed great numbers, Acts 11:26. And then we read later that Paul and Barnabas 
continued in Antioch along with many others, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord, Acts 15, 30, 35. Now, around Paul's first year in Antioch, Agabus, there's a name for you, Agabus, a Christian prophet arrived from Jerusalem and he prophesied something. He says that there is going to be a severe famine all over the world, he says in Acts 11.28. And as a result of this prophecy, the Christian community set up a relief fund for the poor in Judea. They sent this money to the presbyters in Jerusalem through the care of Barnabas and Saul. So they brought this to the people in Acts 11, 29 through 30. So some scholars now maintain that this visit to Jerusalem is the same one mentioned by Paul in Galatians in 2, 1. However, Acts makes no mention of any apostles in Jerusalem at this time. It makes reference only to the presbyters, which refers to the local leaders. So apparently, this visit occurred at the time of Herod. And this was Herod Agrippa. And during this time was his persecution that happened against the leadership of the church. So it's really starting to happen here. And you remember what he did to James? He beheaded James. He was the brother of John, James and John, sons of Zebedee, and intended now to do the same thing to Peter. But what happened? Peter, however, escaped Herod and fled Jerusalem. The Lord had more work for him to do, so he got some kind of a tip-off or something. Now, during a time like this, Barnabas and Paul would have hurried to visit Jerusalem and would have promptly returned to safety in Antioch. They would have kind of been in a rush with all that's going on. So on this visit, Barnabas brought his young cousin, John Mark, to Antioch, uh, bringing him from Jerusalem. So now the Christian community in Jerusalem often met in the home of Mary. And this is the mother of John Mark. So it's easy to get Mary's confused too because there's a whole bunch of those, including me, okay? <laughs> so, so I think, how many do we have in this room? One, two, three. Raise all the Marys, raise your hand. Look at all this. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> so, I mean, or you have Mary in your name or a mother Mary in your family or a, an aunt or something. Perhaps Mary now needed her kinsman Barnabas to take her young son Mark to the safety of Antioch. So yeah, they trust in the Lord and yeah, they know they have their missions to do, but it, it doesn't, he doesn't want us to not be prudent. They still go out of their way to try, out, try to stay out of trouble and keep from getting killed. So apparently now, the second visit with Cephas occurred sometime after Paul's first successful enterprise among the Gentiles. So this was a big thing, his first time coming out here, and it went over very well. So speaking with the leaders of the church, Paul talks as a man who, from personal experience, formulated a method and a policy of working among the Gentiles. You know how you would think, well, wouldn't he go to the Jews? He was the Hebrew of Hebrew and the rabbi of rabbis and a Pharisee and all this. But no, the Lord sends him to the Gentiles and sends fisherman Peter off to the Jews. I mean, is that like totally backwards? But that's the way the Lord works. So this missionary enterprise among the Gentiles occurred a little after taking alms in Jerusalem. And then Paul gives the following description of his visit with Cephas. And here's how he describes it. I went prompted by a revelation, and I laid out for their scrutiny the gospel as I presented it to the Gentiles. All this in private conference with the leaders to make sure the course I was pursuing or had pursued was not useless. 
back in the early days. You see that? Coming to the church, coming to council, making sure he was within keeping with Cephas, our first pope. So he goes on, not even Titus, who was with me, was ordered to undergo circumcision, despite his being a Greek. This was our first big controversy, the big split off. Certain false claimants to the title of brother were smuggled in. They wormed their way into the group to spy on the freedom we enjoy in Christ Jesus and thereby to make slaves of us. But we did not submit to them for a moment. We resisted so that the truth of the gospel might survive intact for your benefit. Those who were regarded as important, however, and it makes no difference to me how prominent they were, God plays no favorites, made me add nothing. He continues, On the contrary, recognizing that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter as his apostle among the Jews had been at work in me for the Gentiles, and recognizing, too, the favor bestowed upon me, those who were the acknowledged pillars, James, Cephas, and John, gave Barnabas and me the hand clasp of fellowship, signifying that we should go to the Gentiles as they to the Jews. The only stipulation was that we should be mindful of the poor, the one thing that I was making every effort to do. You see, there, by working with the authority of the church and with, within those limitations, they're going out there and helping the poor. So that's Galatians 2, 2 through 10. So a strong sentiment exists among scholars that the meeting between Paul and the church leaders described in Galatians is the same meeting that's reported in Acts 15. So certain discrepancies, however, exist between the two accounts, but these discrepancies aren't actually irreconcilable. That there would be discrepancies between the two accounts doesn't really surprise anybody. Why? Because the authors had entirely different purposes in relating the same incident. And that's how we have to look at the scriptures, too. They had different re reasons for writing, who they were writing to, what the point they were trying to make was. And it's not just like a police report of what happened in the car accident. And even then, you get a million different reports, depending on the point of view. So they would, they would give their own personal input, and each presented the incident within the light of his own purpose. So in Acts, Luke records a meeting of church leaders having historical importance for the entire church in which Peter, Paul, and James play a vital role. The decisions of this Jerusalem council now affect the future destiny of the entire Christian church. On the other hand, Paul writes the Galatians about a meeting with church leaders in Jerusalem having personal importance to the apostolic ministry and which has a bearing upon the problem that is presently facing the Galatian Christians. He relates the incident within this context. So those are the two different directions and purposes they're going. So let's look a little bit at this second meeting. In Galatians, Paul mentions going with Barnabas and Titus to Jerusalem again, as it says, after 14 years. Again, meaning he'd been there before. So some have assumed that Paul meant a second time. However, all that Paul actually really implies is that he met with Cephas once again after 14 years. That's really all we know. So according to Acts, the council at Jerusalem occurs after Paul and Barnabas returned from their missionary enterprise among the Gentiles and the Galatians. So now, as we have already seen, the Christian community in Antioch is being disturbed now. And who by? 
the Judaizers. They come from Jerusalem, and they are insisting that the Gentiles observe the Mosaic law. The community now is broiled into a turmoil. So it says here in Acts 15 too, finally, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and some others should go up to see the apostles and presbyters in Jerusalem about this question. This was no small question with people. So among the, quote, some others, we may presume was Titus. And now Titus, as you know, was a Gentile convert, right? One who embodied in himself the actual dispute that is at hand. He was a close associate of Paul, this Titus, and he was a prominent member of the early church, but actually receives no mention in Acts. But you won't really read about that. But it has been suggested that Luke, who, by the way, is the author of Acts, and Titus were now closely related. And in fact, they believe they could have been brothers. So this would explain Luke's reluctance to mention him personally in Acts. Paul mentions going to Jerusalem as a result of a private revelation, as he describes. And this does not, of course, preclude the fact that he could have been sent as part of a delegation from Antioch. He may have been reluctant to be a part of the delegation for personal reasons, and of course, until the Lord instructed him to do so, so we don't really know. But on the other hand, the entire delegation may have been selected as a result of prophecy. That could have happened too. We really don't know. So the account in Acts leaves room for both a private meeting with the leaders of the delegation from Antioch and a public hearing upon the matter. Could have been either one. So it may be presumed that the results of the council meeting have already been promulgated in Galatia and its decrees were being misinterpreted by the Judaizers of Jerusalem. You see how interpretation, someone can get misinterpreting something and go all off in the wrong direction? What does that make you think of? The Eucharist, maybe? How we're supposed to live our lives as opposed to being Jesus all the way and we don't really live out the life that we're supposed to? Uh, the interpretation of Peter as our first pope? We've had all these split-offs based on interpretations and people kind of wanting to do it their own way. Well, as you see, they keep splitting and splitting and splitting, and there's more of that doing it your own way. So you can see the result of that. So now this point, Paul desires to make to the Galatians in that the leaders in private personally confirmed his presentation of the gospel. So he is completely in line. And what could have been a surprise because who would know for sure what his revelation was? They had, to, they had to see what he had to say. And does this fit what we heard from Jesus' mouth? And it did. So Paul says he went with the intention of, quote, laying out for their scrutiny the gospel as I present it to the Gentiles to make sure the course I was pursuing or had pursued was not useless. Galatians 2.2. 2. So this does not imply that Paul had any doubts about the contents of, of his gospel presentation, does it? doesn't imply that. He wasn't sure of himself. His security in what he preached rested upon the personal testimony of Jesus Christ and not upon the confirmation of men. However, if church leaders in Jerusalem were pursuing a contrary course, and this is precisely what the Judaizers in Galatia were preaching, then these leaders would undermine his work and subsequently negate much of his labor. You see what would have happened? 
So that's important to make sure you do what you do under the authority of the church rather than just going out and doing your own thing because you set yourself up to all kinds of problems, all kind of, kinds of criticisms. So if their course differed from his, he wanted to know the reasons why and probably had every intention of correcting him. He was submissive to the church, the church of Christ. However, Paul could report that the leaders of the church were in full agreement with his policy. Isn't that neat? So no stress there. So evidently, the presence of his friend Titus now became a test case at the meeting, which ultimately validated Paul's position. Titus was an uncircumcised Gentile convert to Christianity. So he stands here and now in the heart of Jerusalem within the cradle of Christianity. Members of the party of the Pharisees insisted now that Titus must be circumcised. And perhaps the leaders of the church thought it best that he should be for the sake of peace and the Christian community. And sometimes we see that, that line between keeping the peace and what is God's will in this. And sometimes it's a little hard to determine. Paul comes out, though, and stands adamantly against the circumcision of Titus. And you're thinking, what's with that? What's the big deal? But he saw with crystal clarity the true issue that was at stake, way beyond having him circumcised. It was the message of this. What's the message behind him having this done? So he does not hesitate to unmask his opponents as false Christians. Can you imagine hearing that? He compared them to the enemies that secretly infiltrate another's camp with the purpose of sabotage. Now, wouldn't you consider that a little politically incorrect? It's not always about peace. Paul's arguments won the day, however, and the leaders did not order Titus to be circumcised. So Paul's point to the Galatians is how could they accept men's teaching that the Gentiles should be circumcised when the leaders themselves made no such demands upon the Gentiles? There you go. So and there's a picture of him. So we have Paul, more, moreover, goes on to say that James, Peter, and John recognized his extraordinary vocation as the apostle to the Gentiles. They saw God's work in him to go out there and do that. And they compared his commission to Peter's, implying Paul's equality with Peter in this regard. That's serious. So they acknowledged that Paul was for the Gentiles what Peter was for the Jews. The distinction was probably one more of a geographical thing than it was, say, ethnic. But in other words, Paul would concentrate his ministry in pagan territory and Peter in the Palestine areas. So in actual practice, they both would work for the conversion of both Jew and Gentile, the entire world. And it was a splitting up of tasks. And Paul now ends his account of this incident by relating to the Galatians that, quote, those who were acknowledged pillars, James, Cephas, and John, gave Barnabas and me the hand clasp of fellowship. And there they are, passing on that fellowship saying, you know, we, we agree, we approve of you. And this implies more than just a meeting that ended in friendly terms. It signifies a covenant of friendship has been entered into. And it's an amazing thing. Here, considering where Paul came from, their arch enemy, and to now come all the way to this, this hand clasp of friendship. And they recognized each other as partners in this great apostolic enterprise. What a glorious thing that must have been to see. So in closing here, let's look about the 
the concept of mindful of the poor. Now, the only stipulation placed on Paul and Barnabas was that they be mindful of the poor as they ministered to the Gentiles. In other words, you can't be so busy preaching, you don't pay, pay attention to the people in needs. And who were these poor exactly? The poor has generally been interpreted to mean not the poor actually of the Gentile world, which probably surprises you, but the poor Jewish Christians of Judea. Seemingly, the early Jewish church suffered much from poverty. This poverty may have resulted from their first fervor when many sold their property and their goods and laid the proceeds before the feet of the apostles, perhaps from that. But also their personal poverty may have been a result of the persecution at that time in which their property was destroyed or confiscated. The author of Hebrews, and you remember from the class in Hebrews, we read this one, he makes mention of this when he wrote, Recall the days gone by when, after you had been enlightened, you endured a great contest of suffering. You even joined in the sufferings of those who were in prison and joyfully assented to the confiscation of your goods, knowing that you had better and more permanent possessions. Anybody remember that from the class on Hebrews? So also charity in Judea was dispensed through the local synagogues like it is through our churches. We have fam, we have the food collections, and we, have, we collect money to send out all over Catholic charities. And being mindful of the Jewish poor would always continue to remain a concern for Paul. We find that... Um, Actually, later, Paul writes to the Romans when he says, Just now I am leaving for Jerusalem to bring assistance to the saints. He calls them the saints. Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia have kindly decided to make a contribution for those in need among the saints in Jerusalem. They did so of their own accord, yet they are also under obligation. For the Gentiles have shared in the spiritual blessings of the Jews. Think about that. Shared in their spiritual blessings. They ought to contribute to their temporal needs in return. Isn't that interesting? So I just, that's kind of a twist you may not have, have thought. They shared in their, their spiritual blessings that they shared with us and brought us Gentiles in, right? And they suffered a lot to do that haven't they? So look where we are, and we have to help our brothers and sisters too. So we have to think about this a minute now. Are we actually heeding Paul's words with respect to the needs of our fellow brothers and sisters? Are we always being mindful of this? Because recall the words of our Lord when he said, whatsoever you do for the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. So that's something we have to keep in our, our hearts all the time in our minds, that um, we must share the blessings that we have, the things we've been graced with, and we have so much wealth and so many spiritual blessings that uh, we, as much as we still do, we Americans love to grouse and complain, me among the best of them, but um, we've got to look at what we have in relation to other people and share that and show them that it's God's blessing to us, not something we've done on our own, not something, I mean, you can say we're lucky we got born here, but um, it's all God's grace, and he's given us a special mi mission to use our wealth and use our tools to share with other people. So, so that's our goal for this week. Let's work on it, everybody, and uh, let's see what's coming up next week. We have, why were certain men considered pillars? How'd that get going? And two, what exceptions to this criteria actually were there? And three, what happened to the agape feast custom? Where did that go? That was kind of a neat thing. And four, did Peter make a mockery of the Lord's Supper? Huh? What kind of a question is that? But there's some interesting things. How did Paul deal with this? And six, how do we Catholics view observance of the law? How do we look at that today? Seven, what does the law 
actually force us to do? Hmm. Eight, was Peter's behavior in keeping with his character? Nine, what did Paul possess that very few people do? And finally, 10, what can we expect from a pope? What should we expect? So these are some kind of feisty questions that we're going to learn a lot about. So I hope you can stew over them and lay awake every night thinking about them. And I'll be seeing you next week. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.